goes through towards the left world to the spleen and turns downwards as a splenic fracture into the descending colon. The sigmoid colon is set like a S and is at the distal end of the descending colon that leads to the rectum. And the rectum terminates in the lower opening of the GI called anus. So now take a look at the picture again. So pharynx, oral cavity, tongue, all the sal salivary glands, esophagus, stomach, you have a liver, pancreas and gallbladder right there, esophagus, the food goes into the stomach, from stomach to the small intestine, from small intestine to the large intestine, and the final left over through anus. As the food turns into the nutrients, okay, and the villi takes its role and the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels are communicating and working together, whatever remains that continues to go downwards into the uh, colon or the large intestine, right? What large intestine does? It would absorb whatever water is out there to convert the remainder into a solid stools or the feces. And that's how the, the feces or the stools leave the body. Interestingly, you may notice that throughout the flow of the food from mouth to anus, food doesn't pass through the liver or the gallbladder or the pancreas, right? But these three, the liver, gallbladder and pancreas, Although food does not pass through these organs, but they play a crucial role because they secrete the enzymes, they secrete the juices, they secrete the chemicals that is needed and we'll get into all those details to better understand that. So this is the GI tract, we have a liver here, we have uh, different ducts here, uh, left hepatic duct, right hepatic duct, um, the common bile duct to the uh, gallbladder, the pancreatic duct is there to the pancreas, but liver, gallbladder and pancreas. Just different views to better grasp what we have and how beautifully God has created our body. So again, this is your liver, stomach, esophagus, stomach, the spleen is right there behind, uh, pancreas, your small intestine and big intestine. The colon is the, in the medical literature you will see that simply speaking colon means large intestine. Yet another view of these three is called a biliary system. So this slide gives you some better view about the right hepatic duct, left hepatic duct that is in the liver, right? It goes down, you have a gallbladder right there, the gallbladder has a cystic duct, it goes down, then it turns into the left and right hepatic duct, turns into the common hepatic duct, the cystic duct is there, right over here, we have the pancreas, pancreas does its role through pancreatic duct, the common bile duct, pancreatic duct, everything eventually leads to the duodenum. So let's talk about liver for a while. So what liver does, liver as we know is located right in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen and it manufactures bile very important so what is this bile this bile contains cholesterol that we normally talk without knowing so liver manufactures the bile this bile contains cholesterol bile acids and several other bile pigments okay 
and one of this pigment is called bilirubin and what is bilirubin recall in our hematology presentation we were saying that the red blood cells are destroyed here so bilirubin is the waste product of the hemoglobin destruction where the red blood cells are destroyed what liver does liver combines the bilirubin with bile and they both are excreted into the duodenum finally they are leaving the body in the form of feces or stools and as I was showing you in the previous slides the various ducts they play a role hepatic duct, cystic duct not going to repeat again it reiterates the same thing but these ducts are releasing what is needed to convert the food into the nutrients the essential components remains in our body and the leftover kicks out so the duodenum receives the mixture of bile and pancreatic juices, juices. and what bile does actually it, it has a detergent like effect on the fats of the duodenum because the major process happens in the small intestine right so bile has a detergent like effect on the on the fats in the duodenum because it breaks apart the large fat globules so that enzymes from the pancreas can digest the fats and there is a medical term called emulsification for that process so guess what what would happen without the bile? Without the bile, most of the fat taken into the body would remain undigested. So, one of the key aspect or the function of the liver in our body is producing the bile. But besides that, liver does many other functions. What it does is it, it keeps the amount of glucose or the sugar in the blood at a normal level so what happens there could be a situation where you have more you have less so liver plays a role there could be a time when liver will remove the excess glucose from the bloodstream and stores to be used when needed and sometimes it can reverse the process when the blood sugar level is dangerously low and there are different terms labeled as glycogen or glycogenose lysis or the gluconeogenesis right so in the last category what liver does it can convert the proteins and fats into the glucose when the body needs sugar so liver plays a big role here besides that liver does manufacture some of the proteins that is necessary to clot the blood right it as we said before it destructs the red blood cells or the old erythrocytes and release the bilirubin it does remove the detoxification from the blood so those are the things that liver does something of interest just as in a fire eye that what in the medical literature you will notice is called hepatic portal system hepatic portal system is what once the food is converted into the nutrients and the villi does work with the lymphatic vessels and the blood vessels the rich blood or the rich blood stream from the duodenum liver is the one who first gets that so the process is labeled as hepatic portal system let's take a close look at the pancreas so what pancreas does we have seen the slides different slides so what pancreas does pancreas does different things as an exocrine or and as an endocrine organ so it will release the juice or the enzymes amylase and lipase to help digest the food right so that's the one thing that it does 
And remember the pancreatic duct that we saw, we have seen before. So this pass into the duodenum through the pancreatic duct. And of course, we all know whether we have any medical background or not about the diabetes. So another important aspect of pancreas is pancreas secretes the insulin. And this hormone is needed to release sugar from the blood to be used for energy by cells of the body. Diabetes is a separate presentation, so we are not going to cover here. There are various other details that we need to cover on, in this presentation series. So again, one more time, saying is believing. So, parotid, sublingual, submandibular, all the saliva glands, pharynx, oral cavity, tongue, esophagus, your diaphragm is there, liver, gallbladder, and the pancreas, these, these three things work together. Stomach, food goes from the esophagus to stomach, stomach to small intestine, small intestine to large intestine, and finally, the left over through anus. So this is just to give an overview of the fundamentals of the anatomy, the different organs and what they do, just an overview. So what if something goes wrong? And then we call disorders, right? So let's take a quick look at frequently encountered disorders. So you can have oral leukoplakia, which are, uh, so what we will do, we will try to follow the GI tract. So from mouth to anus, because something happened in the family with ulcerative colitis and that's where I started. So I thought it would be more meaningful if we start from the top and then we go at the bottom. So we'll take a quick look at some fundamentals or the basic conceptual understanding of the different disorders and that is something that we frequently see. So we'll start with the mouth and the oral cavity. So we can have oral leukoplakia. So these are the white plaques or the patches on the mucus of the mouth. So this could be a precancerous condition and the two killers that contributes to this medical disorder is the chronic tobacco and the alcohol use. Okay, so if you are a chronic tobacco user or a chain smoker, think about and be ready for the consequences. That goes with alcohol as well. There are various other uh, non-concerning but yet just to list, you could have inflammation of the mouth with small ulcers, tooth decay, uh, cold sores, inflammation of gums, gingivitis, so on and so forth, okay? Not, not that concerning, but of course, anything and everything from mouth to venous, any tumor, any cancer, any malignancy is of concern. And that would be something that we have to dive deep into the technicalities. It depends upon the grade and stage and all that. So in this presentation series, we are not talking about the tumor or cancer, but we are covering other that may turn into the malignancy. So we will look at the frequently encountered major disorders, excluding the tumor or the cancer. So let's move on. So this is what I just said. So this is GERD gastroesophageal reflux disease, frequently encountered by many of us. No big deal, not concerning, it happens to everybody. However, there are a few things we need to know. So what happens, you feel the burning, burning feeling in your chest and throat, right? And whatever you have had, you feel like it's coming out, it, it's, it's coming backward, there is a reflux. So why that happens? You have a sphincter, remember? The sphincter probably in a healthy person it remains closed and here in the reflux or the gastroesophageal reflux disease what happens that doesn't work properly and it allows the acid to come up and that makes you feel the burning sensation. So what doctors will do, they will do the biopsy, endoscopy to investigate, 
Um, from underwriting standpoint, you need to watch out for the frequency or the severity of the symptoms. Any complications like Barrett's esophagus, what is Barrett's esophagus? We'll get into that soon. Or inflammation of esoph esophagus called esophagitis, right? Um, are we dealing with any history of uh, having a surgery, so on and so forth? So generally, GERD is not considered that concerning unless it leads to, of course, any kind of malignancy or the balance esophagus and things like that. So, as I said, we'll look into the Barrett's esophagus. So, Barrett's esophagus, remember, now we know, we have seen multiple times the GI tract slide, right? So, now you know, this tube is esophagus. So, in Barrett's esophagus, simply speaking, it's a, it could be a complication of chronic GERD or a chronic reflux. It could damage the lining of the tube that may lead to Barrett's esophagus and unfortunately statistically speaking then we are looking at and dealing with a greater risk of exposure 